Welcome, everyone. Everyone. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. To the first ever Strange House Books reading at Fright Night Film Fest 2012. We are here, myself, Kevin Strange, Nicholas Day, and D.F. Noble are going to read selections from a few of our stories. My chapbook, my Lovecraftian horror chapbook, The Planet Backwards Plays One Last Gig, has a special bonus short story in it called God's Act. That's what I'm going to be reading. So, without further ado, ado I'm going to jump right in and we're going to read this story. And then Don and Nick are going to take over. Uh, uh, excuse me. And that's what we're going to do. So, jumping right in to God's Act from the Planet Backwards chapbook available now at strangehousebooks.com for ten dollar, ten money dollars. All right, God's Act by Kevin Strange. Edwin spotted them the moment he stepped off the train. The men in black, the agents. That lying fuck, he said under his breath. Edwin turned to hop back on the train, but the shorter, stockier of the two agents grabbed his backpack, easily overpowering Edwin's smallish 14-year-old frame and halting any forward progress Edwin had hoped to make. Edwin Marshalls, by order of the Department of Homeland Security, you are coming with us. How original, Edwin quipped, brushing his shaggy brown hair back into his eyes as they marched him toward the black escalade. The taller, fatter of the two agents forcefully took Edwin's pack off his back. Are they in the bag? Fatty asked. His accent was decidedly southern. Or what in the bag? Edwin asked, playing dumb. As they rounded the corner, away from the crowded train station, away from prying eyes, the short one punched Edwin in the side of the face, sending Edwin sprawling onto the sharp gravel below his feet. Ow! Edwin looked around at the empty parking lot, hoping to spot some means of escape. There's nothing in the bag, the tall one said in uh, into the communication piece attached to his ear. Edwin felt a molar come loose when he nudged it with his tongue. He spat out blood and said, where's Brad? Brad told me he'd be here. I explicitly said no agents. Bradley Charney's dead, Shorty said. His accent was unidentifiable, due mostly to his pronounced and ridiculous lisp. Give us the stones. They're highly unstable. This is a very serious situation, Edwin. Edwin cursed under his breath. He pulled a small Tupperware container out of his pocket. Time for plan B, he thought. Deftly, and without catching the attention of his captors, Edwin popped the three marble-sized, pulsing blue stones into his mouth and swallowed hard. Then, standing on shaky legs, he said, Five million in cash. That's what I asked for. That's what I'm getting if you want your little alien rocks. Shorty whipped the rear passenger side door open. He forced Edwin inside, and then crawled in after him as Fatty got into the driver's seat, started the truck, and pulled away. Shorty took off his generic black sunglasses. Edwin was half surprised to see brown eyes behind them. He sort of expected them to be black, like everything else these goons carried. Look, I know you think you hit the jackpot when the meteor landed inside your kitchen, kid, but don't, but you don't understand just how many innocent lives are in danger by having those stones out here in public like this. He unholstered his pistol and placed it threateningly in his lap. Black, of course. Edwin looked the agent in his brown eyes and said, I'd love to give you the rocks, Powell. Unfortunately, I ate them. The truck screeched to a stop in the middle of the road. Fatty, who Edwin now noticed was sporting a pretty bad comb over, made worse by his bristly ginger red hair, spun around frantically. You ate the stones? Yep. Figured Brad would fuck me. Figured you wouldn't pay. Thought, what the hell? I'll down him with a little uh, Frosted Flakes and see, what ha see if what happened to my mom happened to me too. The agents looked at each other nervously. Fatty spoke into his earpiece. Situation has upgraded to a level seven. I repeat, level seven, full threat level. The subject has come into immediate proximity with the stones. Send all available backup to our location. GPS coordinates sent. The agents sat still as statues. Finally, Fatty added, and please hurry. Edwin began to glow. A bright blue luminescence filled the large cab of the Escalade. It pulsed rhythmically in time with Edwin's breathing. His shaggy brown hair stood on end, creating a series of jagged spikes which waved threateningly. Finally, Shorty spoke. That was suicide, Edwin. Suicide. Edwin grew noticeably larger in the moment. He now had to duck his head to avoid touching the high ceiling of the truck. 
His voice took on a curious harmonic quality, as though his words were being naturally auto-tuned. Was it suicide when your friends gunned down my mother in cold blood? Was it suicide when you dissected her still living body while she screamed in pain? Was that suicide? Fatty spoke this time, slowly, cautiously. It was a matter of nat national security, Edwin. What burst out of your house was no longer your mother. It was a monster. It had to be put down. We had no way of knowing whether or not her condition was contagious until the proper tests had been run. Shorty moved his trembling hand towards the door. Edwin began to drip raw energy into the seat cushions. Spots where it touched instantly melted away. Command is in two minutes. Command is two minutes out. They've authorized engagement, Fatty said, reaching for his gun. Edwin heard the helicopters and assault vehicles before the agents did. He could hear everything now, literally everything. He heard the elderly fat lady at Kroger, half a mile away, haggling with the disinterested young clerk about the price of her eggs after the coupon. He heard the happy family in the car on I-95, 150 miles away, singing songs and laughing with one another. And he heard the fighter jets screaming through the air at 700 miles per hour with his name in their headsets. Edwin grew again ripped the roof off the Escalade like a can opener works a container of sardines, forcing the agents out into the street. They were babbling into their earpieces, aiming their black guns at what used to be his head. He no longer cared what the agents said or what they did. He tried to open his eyes and was amused to find that he no longer had eyes and that he could see everything without them. Everything. Clearly. The agents opened fire. Their bullets simply flashed blue as they harmlessly entered his new body. They caused him no worry. With his thoughts, Edwin turned the agents into blue flames, which flickered and then went out almost instantly. Surprisingly, though, the two men were not dead. Not in the sense that Edwin understood life and death now. Time, space, matter, energy, all of these terms were relative. Human terms. Terms he could no longer relate to. The agents were not really dead. Their personalities had left a mark on the particles around them. A sort of emotional fingerprint before absorbing back into the whole of reality. Edwin was in awe, seeing it all, hearing it all, understanding everything perfectly for the first time in his life. The irony was not lost on him that it took an organism launched through vigintillions of years and unfathomable miles from a long dead planet to awaken, him a, to awaken in him a true understanding of the human race and its full potential and purpose in the universe. He saw and understood connections and pathways between light and love, between death and time, that no mortal being had any right to conceive. He reveled in his newfound enlightenment. Edwin grew one final time. He gushed now. Blue plasma cascaded down from his titanic form as a radioactive avalanche of death and destruction. It swept through the city streets like a nightmarish tsunami of protoplasmic sludge. Tens of thousands perished where they stood like little blue pulses on, ele on an electronic switchboard. Hundreds of thousands more would die in the coming days and weeks as new and terrible forms of cancerous disease overtook their fragile forms. Mile after mile of once fertile terror would be left uninhabitable for millions of years. Does an organism weep for thousands of dead bacteria when it's infested with billions more? The black choppers and military tanks had arrived. There were no, they were no more concerned to him than a tick is to the elephant. His mind raced. He knew he only had moments to live before his gelatinous body collapsed entirely. The final growth brought with it the realization that he was no longer Edwin Marshalls. He was God now. He saw into the souls of every person walking the earth, saw their thoughts, their dreams. He knew he had the power to destroy them all like he did the agents, like a child drowning in ant hill. He wanted to for what they did to his mother, for what they'd done to each other since the first hominid picked up a rock and smashed in his brother's skull. But Edwin could not hate these people. Gods do not hate. Human beings simply did not know, did not understand as a whole what he understood now. And it made him sad. Edwin began to dissolve, to come apart. In his final moment, he did not doom human civilization. Instead, he sent out, without knowing if he even possessed that kind of power, one thought. One thought he hoped to plant in the mind of every person on the planet. As the last of him pulled away from itself, he did not care that he would not live long enough to see if his thought had the intended impact. Gods don't care. Gods act.
in the instant of his demise, the Edwin Marshalls, that was no longer an Edwin Marshalls, but instead something entirely new, something that had never existed in all of the fathomless depths of the universe before, and may never exist again, sent out his one thought to seven billion minds simultaneously. His dying thought, we are all one.